Hello, I'm Chris Hartwell, and welcome to The Hearts Beat. Today, we're going to be talking about episode 7 of season 6 of HBO's Game of Thrones. Join me, won't you? So, this is one of those episodes where characters just kind of generally stand around and refuse to unite, communicate, or ally with one another, which really has been one of the staples of this show since its inception. Things so rarely being easy, and the writers quite often making the characters endure a handful of no's before they ever get that coveted yes. And when they do finally get that yes, quite often the happiness that accompanies it very quickly turns to ash in their mouths. But rather than being annoying, one of the truly phenomenal things about this show is just how thrilling those no's can be to watch. I would even argue that what some of the best episodes of Game of Thrones have done is never given that yes to a character's initial request, but instead opened a completely different door to them, which both feels completely unexpected, but also somehow completely right. As the show has gone on though, and we've grown accustomed to that style, the real trick has been to get us to invest in any character's initial desire or quickly attained happiness. And that really made the opening of this episode, which started with this very pleasant scene of Ian McShane's brother Ray and his followers quite happily just constructing some sort of tower, almost laughable. I really think my first thought when watching the episode was, well, this is gonna all end horribly. And I mean, if you look at the color correction in that scene alone, it's quite clear that director Mark Millard really wanted this patch of Westeros to stand apart and feel distinct to nearly every other corner of this frozen, parched, or rotten world. And of course, that feeling was only compounded when we discover who has taken up company with these rather peaceful folks, that being Sander Clegane, AKA the Hound. Which, let's go ahead and use that to segue into this week's first Twitter question, which comes to us from Griffin Watson, who asks, okay, so the Hound is alive, cool. Now, why do we care? He seemed to serve his purpose last season with Arya. Yep, great question, Griffin, one which I myself was almost immediately asking as soon as the Hound reappeared in this episode, feeling quite similar to the way that I did when Danny initially returned to the Dothraki. Thinking at that point as well, okay, what's the point? Hadn't the storyline run its course already? I will admit though that as Danny's storyline continued to unfold, even as I would argue that it was just a little bit rushed and kind of botched in its execution, I did like the fact that David and D.B. were exploring something new with Danny's character conceptually, which does give me hope that they're not just bringing back Sanders' character as mere fan service or because they have run out of ideas, but rather because he has more to do. A hope which was certainly kindled just a little bit more with the writers quite clearly recognizing the need to provide an answer to that question by having the character of Ray state after his kind of obligatory sort of lazily written an exposition as to how the Hound has survived, there is a reason that you are still here. As per what that reason could be, though I do agree with you, Griffin, that how his story ended with Arya was pretty perfect and did bring great closure to that part of his life, I also feel like the show has shown us additional sides to the Hound that could still use further resolution, namely his relationship with his brother. Though at the same time, I really don't feel like the show has set this up all that well, because one, I really don't see how the Hound could make it all the way to King's Landing in time to face off against his brother in Cersei's trial by combat, and two, we've really gotten no indication that the reanimated mountain is the real Gregor Clegane anymore, which would make a face-off against the Hound not all that emotionally satisfying. With Brienne traveling south, though, there is always the possibility that those two could meet up again and go for a round two. And though I don't think it carries enough weight to wholly justify the Hound's return, I do think it's worth noting that he has faced off against the followers of the Red God back in season three when he actually killed Beric Dondarrion, only to have that man come back to life. Which, like I said, will give some weight and sense of unfinished business to the upcoming confrontation with those men, being that they follow the same religion, but again, just not enough to wholly justify his return. Also, kind of just a random side note, with those brothers showing up in such close proximity to the Hound's own return, it might be worth considering that maybe, just maybe, he was kept alive or brought back to life by the same power that resurrected Dondarrion? I'm really not sure, but I think I can conclusively say this. It will take a lot more than a few of Ray's sermons to convince me that the primary reason the Hound was brought back was to be redeemed. And if some sort of lasting change is to occur in that man, I really feel like the catalyst should be the knowledge that he was all but dead and given the second chance. And speaking of revenge-fueled plot lines, let's go ahead and jump on over to Theon and Yara, who are at... Yes, surprise, surprise, yet another brothel, just so that HBO can continue to dish out its very necessary nudity, though... To be fair, this season has been significantly less gratuitous in this area, and on this episode specifically, it was helped along somewhat in the sense that the location itself was somewhat utilized to communicate a couple of important ideas. One, for reasons unknown, and perhaps because there isn't and never will be reasons to be known, we learn something about Yara's sexuality, which, dare I speculate, may somehow come into play when the Greyjoys finally catch up with Danny. And two, 
it did serve as a decently effective catalyst to illustrate to Yara yet again just how little of her brother is left within him. And did also lead to, minor though it may be, yet another Theon character arc victory. And this is not even me saying that Theon is my favorite character or that this is my favorite plotline of the series. It's just that it hasn't been since Jamie's time with Brienne that we've gotten such dynamic and propulsive character evolution on this show. And the step that Theon really took this week was kind of just re-owning his name. And yes, it has been a time since he shed the name of Reek, but he really is still cowering in the shadow of that name, clinging to fear, shame, and brokenness. And Yara really has no time for that at all. And it was kind of interesting, too, that both the Hound and Theon kind of ended in the same place this week, both striking forth on these paths to revenge. But for both of them, what happened prior and the counsel they received prior was so very different and will likely lead them to very different destinations. Which really does make me nervous for Theon especially. When he entered this episode, he did understand and believe that justice for his past actions should have been his own death. But Yara now, while forcing alcohol down his throat, is really pressuring him to take his eyes off of that. Over in King's Landing, though, we at long last learned that Marjorie has never taken her eyes off the desire to prosper and protect the Tyrell name. A revelation that, for me and my interest in that storyline, happened in just the nick of time. Because even as I found the location and lighting of the High Sparrow's living room, so to speak, to be rather glamorous, we'd spent so much time there with very little variance in the photography and drama that I was beginning to rather fatigue of it. Though, I can't admit, this week, the scene did kind of highlight some interesting similarities between the High Sparrow and this new character of Brother Ray. Both men having walked away from past corruption and brokenness to now seek to bring others into the same light in which they themselves stand. But while the High Sparrow believes that holiness is earned through penance and pain, Ray sought it through work, striving to give back to the measure that he had once taken away. The real bummer, though, with kind of Marjorie's clever reveal to her grandmother that all along she'd been acting out of her family's best interest by slipping her that note with the Tyrell Rose drawn on it was... The writers had never really made us fully believe in her conversion to the faith, so when at long last they revealed that she wasn't converted, it was more of a, oh, thank goodness we can stop investing in that charade, versus a, ooh, I didn't see that coming kind of surprise. To look at it positively, though, it does give me hope that the show can now move forwards a little more confidently with that storyline. And it did arm Lady Tyrell with just enough information to really shut down Cersei in that scene. Which was another moment where a character basically dumped a bunch of exposition, really spelling out where characters stood and why. But in that instance, I found it to be used much more effectively, as the reminder was as much to Cersei as it was to us, only further fueling what I'm sure will be a rather explosive response to all that's been done to Cersei and her family over the past couple of seasons. And it was for the sake of that same family that Jamie this week rode north to River Run, kind of approaching his own personal eruption. And that really was kind of my primary takeaway from all of he and Blackfish's interactions. Just that Jamie, who does everything for the sake of his family, cannot combat in the same way he always has this man who is so ready to sacrifice his own. Their pressure points are just so very different. And also pertaining to that storyline, something that the avid YouTube commenter Kevin Moore has pointed out a few times, who is just, this guy is just a well of Game of Thrones and a Song of Ice and Fire, just knowledge so check out his comments below, you will not regret that you have, but something that he's pointed out in past episodes have just been the geographical contrivances that have happened this season. Just as far as the writers kind of ignoring the distances between places and the obstacles that should have affected those traveling between them. And though he's always been right, I actually haven't felt it until this episode. Not only did Jamie get to River Run like it was a quick stroll up the block, but John, Sansa, and Davos hopped around like all these places they were visiting were just right next door to one another when they really weren't. Though, at the same time, their storyline did probably give me my favorite moment of the episode, that being Davos connecting and reasoning with this young child in a way that completely put every other character's negotiating skills on this episode to shame, while at the same time making me sad all over again that Shireen Baratheon is dead. And it was also just fantastic seeing this young 10-year-old child in a world where all these decisions are constantly being made by these old bearded men commanding such authority, even as she wasn't commanding such a huge army. Though I also did appreciate that her intelligence and position was lent a bit more reality as she was hemmed in by those two advisors. One trek that isn't happening quite as quickly, though, is Brienne's Down to River Run, though it will be very interesting to see what happens when she gets there, because she may single-handedly actually bring together all these different storylines. It is worth asking, could the one thing that pushes Blackfish to surrender and leave River Run with his army be a call for aid from his niece? And could that same call, when discovered by Jamie, push him and his army further north to fight alongside the Boltons? All of this folding into one for our season six finale, both the battles of River Run and the battles of Winterfell. And though I'm sure she has not died because of the events of this last episode, I do have a hard time imagining that Arya will actually make it for any of these battles, considering that she has at long last gotten her comeuppance for betraying the Brotherhood. And as hard as the show pushed to make this act shocking and violent, even seeming to attempt
Sam to elect our memories of the Red Wedding, I just had a hard time getting over how illogical Arya was for wandering around Braavos in the daytime. And as pleased as I am to see Arya suffering some form of consequences for her actions, I'm still nervous that these ones won't be any more permanent than her blinding at the end of last season. Which brings us to our second Twitter question of the day, which comes to us from Daniel Oshensky, who asks, Given the turn of events, what do you think Arya's role will be when all the plot lines converge? Well, excellent question, Daniel, one which I'll kind of approach from two different angles. First, let's consider how closely we've been shown Arya's steps away from the Brotherhood to the Hound's steps back onto the show. A character who, now that his name's been uncrossed off her list, may well be one of her first targets. But second, as we discussed with Sander Clegane, or the Hound, we don't want that relationship to eclipse all the rest that Arya is. Even though they spent two seasons together, there is still so much more that she wants, and there's still so much more to that girl. She still is a Stark, and no matter how much she's despised Sansa in the past, she's been through a lot since they last met, and distance does have a way of making the heart grow fonder. So while it could be very cool to see Arya head down to King's Landing and take out Cersei, the Mountain, Ellen Payne, or anyone else on her list, it would also be extremely exciting to see her put her assassin skills to good use for Jon and Sansa. Maybe even taking out Ramsay Bolton on some sort of stealth mission, and I don't think she ever learned to wear the faces of the dead, but if she did, how cool would it be if she wore Roose's face and just haunted his murderous son? Those are my thoughts anyways on this week's episode of Game of Thrones. I would love to know what you guys thought of the episode, though, so definitely comment below and let me know. Also, I'd love to answer more of your guys' Twitter questions, so definitely hop on over to Twitter, hashtag those the heartbeat, and I will answer as many of them as I can right here on the show. Finally, please to subscribe. I'm going to continue to review films and television on this channel, and I would love for you to stay up to date on all of those things. But for now, I'm Chris Hartwell. This is The Heartbeat. Thank you for joining me.